Amy, Sarah. Okay. Um, save this one. Other questions? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about acid-base reactions, and then we'll try to do a little bit about the redox chemistry as well, okay? So acid-base reactions involve an acid, and again, an acid is typically a compound that has hydrogen in it. So the first element you're going to see in the formula is hydrogen, and then you're going to see typically a non-metal that comes after it. So it could be HCl. It could be H2CO3. So see how you got the hydrogen in the front? It could be, for example, H3PO4. These are all examples of acids. And what they have in common is that when you put them into water, they break up into ions. So they're kind of interesting substances because in a way, they behave very similarly, or at least somewhat similar to ionic compounds, right? That's what an ionic compound does, is it breaks up into ions when you put it into water. Acids do the same thing, but they are considered molecular compounds, even though they do form ions. But they're sort of a special class. We call them acids. And so here's an example. For those of you that have taken any anatomy and physiology, you're familiar with uh, the bicarbonate ion. That's this one over here. Okay, so this, this one over here is called carbonic acid, H2CO3. This one right here, this one's called phosphoric acid. And so see what's happening? You're just taking off a H plus and then what you get is you get the negative ion, the anion, as a product there. So when these acids dissolve into water, they form a hydrogen ion. And they form an anion, which you will see this in the next course if you go on to take it. It's often referred to as a conjugate base. Okay, so you form a hydrogen ion and a conjugate base. Now we also have bases. And so the bases again are the alkali metals with a hydroxide. And so what happens with these is when you dissolve them into water, you get an ion, a metal ion and a hydroxide ion. You can also have some from the second row. So for example, uh, let's do strontium. Now what's interesting about the second column, these alkaline earth metals, so that would be magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, is that they actually will form two hydroxide ions. Okay, so if they're in the second column, if the metal is in the second column, you get two hydroxides. If it's in the first column, group 1A, you just get one hydroxide. So you get twice as much hydroxides with the second column, okay? And those are the bases. And so what happens is these two substances have a chemical affinity towards each other they react with each other pretty easily. And we call that an acid-base reaction. So if we just pick one of these acids, I'm gonna pick the simple ones, and one of these bases, they will react with each other. And here's how you predict what the products are gonna be. You take the hydrogen and you combine it with the hydroxide. Those two go together. And you take the metal 
and the non-metal, and you combine those together. It's often referred to as a double replacement or double displacement or an exchange. Sometimes people call it an exchange. But when you take the hydrogen and the hydroxide, you get water. And when you take the metal with the non-metal, put the metal first and then the non-metal, you get what's called a salt. So we're used to the term salt, meaning sodium chloride, NaCl. But a salt from a chemical perspective could be many different substances. It's essentially the product of a reaction between an acid and a base is the salt. And then you also get water. So if you want to call it NaCl, NaCl would be called table salt, sodium chloride. Any salt is just a substance that's produced from an acid-base reaction. And so there you go. That's what it looks like. That's the reaction of an acid base. And this is an important reaction in biology, biochemistry, molecular biology. It's also an important type of reaction in the ocean, man maintaining the acidity of the ocean and the chemistry of the ocean, lakes and rivers, and even in clouds. Acid-base chemistry even occurs in clouds. So on the earth, acid-base chemistry is very, very important class of reactions. It determines a lot of the chemistry that goes on in the surface of the earth, within the rocks and all of that. Um, probably not as an important of a type of reaction if you were looking at the chemistry of the moon, for example. The moon probably doesn't have much acid-base chemistry going on because there's no water or very little water and whatever water there is is frozen. But if you look in the atmosphere of Venus, or the atmosphere of the earth or the oceans of the earth or in organisms, acid-base chemistry is one of the most important types of reactions. And so we can look at it as just the reaction of an acid with a base to form water and a salt, okay? Generally, what we wanna be able to do is to write out what's called the net ionic equation for an acid-base reaction. So let me save this photo here and get you another one. So HCl, and we're gonna assume that we're doing this in water. So we'll put aqueous for the acid in the base, and we'll put aqueous for the salt, and then water is a liquid. Okay. So now the issue is writing the net ionic equation. And here's a method. When you look at videos, so I've made a few videos for chapter four that are on YouTube, or you can look at other videos on YouTube. Um, you'll find that there's different ways for writing net ionic equations for acid-base reactions, but I'm going to show you one method right now, and that is to do the following. Really what we're interested in is finding what is it, what are the reactants that make water? Okay, so water's the key here. An acid-base reaction, water is the interesting part of it. So really all you have to do is figure out which ions make water. And the water, the ions that make water are this one right here, which is the hydrogen ion. And this one right here, which is the hydroxide ion. Those are the two ions that make the water. And then we just wanna make sure we put the states of matter. So water is a liquid. These are dissolved in water and they're ions. So ions are dissolved in water. So we put aqueous and this would be the net ionic equation. Okay. Now the other substances, so I'm ignoring the chloride, for example, and the lithium, those are called spectator ions. Lithium and chloride. And the term spectator means that they're in the solution, they're in the mixture, but they're not part of the reaction that's forming water. The ions that form water are the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion, but not the lithium and not the chloride. So those are called spectator ions, okay? Now, any questions?
Okay, so let me take a look here and let me see if I can find, oops, any questions that might require a little bit more information. I do have a question. Okay. How would that how would that problem have been worded? What you just showed us. Sure. So it could be worded this way. It could be worded write the net ionic equation for the reaction between hydrochloric acid and lithium hydroxide. So that's one way it could be done. Um, let's see here. It could be written, it could be written as an equation. It could just say, predict the products of the reaction, right? So if I said HCl, aqueous, LiOH, aqueous, predict the products of this reaction. I'm just trying to understand how you know that you leave out the ions. Like that you I'm gonna show you that. I'll show you that. That's a good question. Let me show you how to do that. So first, what I would recommend is that if you recognize, look, see how that's an acid and that's a base. So now you go into your thinking, okay, what type of reaction is it first? It's not a precipitation because it's an acid and a base. So we're going to treat this as an acid base. So what do we do? We take the first part and combine it with the second part of the second one. So those two are going to go together. So HOH, which is water. And then the first part of the second one combines with the second part of the first. That's the idea of the double replacement. So LICL. Then what you do is you say, okay, oh, I recognize that's water. Water is a liquid. So I'm going to put L. And LICL, oh, I see, that's an ionic compound. It's got a metal and a nonmetal. So how do we deal with ionic compounds? We look at the solubility guidelines. The solubility guidelines tell us that any alkali metal, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or ammonium, those are aqueous, right? Those are soluble in water. So we put aqueous there. Okay. Now you could add like you were you were asking. That's a good question. So so how do we know which ions are important and which ones are not? Okay. Here is an approach that people will often use. What they will do is they will take each of the substances. If it says aqueous, see how all three of these are aqueous. Only one of them is not aqueous, and that's the water. So what they do, let's go back to the meaning of aqueous. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Acids, bases, and ionic compounds, if they're aqueous in water, what that means is they form ions. They dissolve into separate ions. So we do that for all three of these. We write them as separate ions. See how I'm doing this? I'm writing each of these reactants as two separate ions because that's the physical meaning of aqueous for ionic compounds, for acids, and for bases is that they're separated by the water molecules. So the H plus isn't with a Cl minus in water, and the Li plus is not with an OH minus in water. They're separated. So those are the ions on the reactant side. Water's a liquid. It's not aqueous. So we write that as water. And then the third, or the last one here, that one's aqueous. So we write that as separate ions. Now, here's an approach. If you look at the reactant side, there are two ions that are identical with the ions on the product side, Li plus on both sides. So what we do is we use sort of a mathematical analogy. In math, if I gave you the equation 3y plus 2x plus 7 equals 6y plus 4x plus 7, we would recognize that we're adding 7 to both sides. 
So we can cancel those, right? We can cancel the sevens from both sides. We do the same thing here. Since chloride is the same on both sides, we can cancel it. And since lithium is the same on both sides, we can cancel it. And that gives us a simplified equation. And this is called the net ionic equation. So if chloride is always by itself as an ion in water, how is HCl aqueous a thing? Because H2, when you say aqueous, implicit, that's, that has meaning. Aqueous means dissolved in water. So in fact, it's not really together. So what you have to do is you have to say, oh, I see aqueous, that means they're separate. So you could write it this way, right? You could write it this way. So it's not really ever an HCl compound in water. In water, it's not. HCl does not exist as a compound in water. It, it exists as separate ions. And so that is communicated through this aqueous. Okay. Instead of doing this, right? See how, how this is an awkward way to represent it. I mean, that is factually correct. This is, this, is, this is what it actually exists as or closer to what it exists as, right? We're using symbols. But this is a shorthand notation for communicating that, okay? So what happens is what we can do is we can say the following. Lithium and chloride, we're not claiming they're not in there by striking them out. We're just claiming that they're not part of the actual reaction. Remember, a reaction is something is changing. The lithium and the chloride are not really changing. They're just staying as separate ions. So we call them spectator ions. So the ones that you can strike out because they're the same on both sides, we'll call those spectator ions. And again, the result of that, when you do that, is you get H plus, plus OH minus to form H2O. And this is our net ionic equation. Okay. Let me show you one more. Let's do H BR aqueous plus BAOH two aqueous. And here I'm going to add an additional step. So step one, predict the products. Two, balance the equation. Three, find the net ionic equation. And then four, identify the spectator ions. Okay. So let's predict the products. Again, this is an acid, right? It's got the H with the non-metal, so that's an acid. This is barium, second column element with hydroxide, so that's a base. So we're going to treat this as an acid-base reaction. So for acid-base reaction, you take the H plus and you combine it with the OH minus to give you water. And then you take the metal and you combine that with the non-metal to give you the salt. However, we have an issue here. Barium is in group 2A. So that means it has a charge of plus two. Whereas bromide is in group 7A. So that means it has a charge of minus one. So that means if this is minus one and this is plus two, that means you need two of the bromides to balance the charge. So there we go. There's the equation. Let's put the states of matter in. 
anything that has, or, or water, water is a liquid, anything that has bromide in it, there are a couple of exceptions for bromide, but if you go to the solubility guidelines, it's aqueous. Okay. And then we balance it. So that's step one. Let's balance it now. There's one bromide on this side, but there's two on that side. So let's put a two. Now you've got two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here. That's four hydrogens. You've only got two over here. So let's put a two there. And now you can am, I, I'm, am I confused or are you missing an oxygen? Isn't there an extra oxygen on the left? It's OH2, right? So that means there's two oxygens. Right, so where's the second oxygen on the right? Yeah, you had to put it here. That's why you gotta put a two there, right? If you put a two there, now you've oh. got four hydrogens and two oxygens. So with acid-base reactions, yeah, with acid-base reactions, when you balance the hydrogen, I'm sorry, when you balance the, the hydrogen with water in water by putting two in front of the water, you also end up balancing the oxygen. It's kind of a freebie. It actually balances both elements at the same time. It's kind of cool. Um, so there's our balanced equation. Now let's find the net ionic equation. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. The simplest way is just to say, look, I know this is an acid-base reaction, so I know that water is the product in the net ionic equation. So you could just say, look, it's 2H2O. So now we just need the ions to make the water. The ions are H plus and OH minus. So two hydrogen ions and two hydroxide ions. And that'll give you the two waters. The other way to do it would be to do the second procedure, which is break up everything into ions and then cancel out So I'm just going to write this again, just so that you can see it a little closer. Okay, so there's, there's the equation, sometimes referred to as the molecular equation. So remember, it's an acid, so this breaks up into H plus and Br minus, but there's a two in front of it. So two H plus and two Br minus, right? The number in front also refers to the second element. Barium. And then you got two here, so two hydroxides. Okay, so that's breaking them up into ions. That's what they're gonna exist at as in the water. And then you got water, so two waters. And then barium and bromide, so barium and then two bromides. Remember that two in the back comes out in front when it's a separate ion. Think of it this way. If you've got a bicycle, on the bicycle, you know, you've got a frame and you've got two tires, but the tires are part of the same particle, right? They're part of the same substance. So here you have two bromides are part of the same compound. But if you were to take it apart, you would have two separate wheels, right? And that's what happens when things dissolve into water. They break up into separate particles. So we put the two in front to indicate that these are separate particles instead of doing this. We don't write it that way because this would be telling us that they're together as one particle. But in fact, they're separate particles. So we write the two in the front. Okay. Now you can cancel everything that's the same on both sides. And those would be the spectator ions. So you're left with 2H plus, 2OH minus, 2H2O. And that's exactly what we were trying to do here, right? That's it's the same answer as what you get here. So that's two different ways to do it. And then identifying the spectator ions, that's easy. It's whatever you canceled out. So we canceled out the bromide and we canceled out the barium. These are your spectator ions. Okay. And when you're just naming the spectator ions, you don't say how many there are? 
yeah, generally we don't, you know, unless you're doing some sort of real quantitative type analysis, we wouldn't worry about that. There are, you know, you can do problems where they ask those kinds of questions, but we're not going to do that in this course. Okay. So acid-base chemistry. There is one more kind of reaction for acid-base that I want to show you because there's an Alex problem where they have you do it. It's a little bit advanced, but it's pretty simple. So I'll show that to you in a second. Any questions on this one? Okay. So let me show you one more type of problem that comes up. And that is what's called the Bronsted model. It's actually, I'll, I'll write both names. It's Bronsted Lowry model. And this is a different way of looking at acids and bases. Instead of looking at acids and bases as an acid is something that produces H plus and a base is something that forms a OH minus, right? That's actually the Arrhenius model. The Bronsted Lowry model looks at reactions as a reactant one plus reactant two forming product one and product two. So it actually looks at it from a chemical perspective, from a chemical reaction perspective. So let me show you an example. Let's say I take HCl and I claim it's going to react with water. And I want to predict the products. Here's how you approach If you see a problem like this, see how the water doesn't look like a base? It's water. It's not sodium hydroxide. I told you that an acid-base reaction is an acid like HCO plus a base times lithium hydro, you know, lithium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide or barium hydroxide. But if you see that you've got an acid and you're reacting with something like water, then we can actually think of that as an acid-base reaction too. And here's how you go about it. If this is not an obvious base, but it's water, we use this theory here. And so here's how you do it. It's kind of fun. What you do is you say, okay, I know this is HCl, so I know that's an acid. So I'm going to push an H plus onto the water. You take the hydrogen ion and you put it onto the water. So here's what you get. I'm going to show you a little kind of picture of this. So here's your HCl and here's your water. Ascent, oops, let me, let me turn it around. Let's make it a little bit more physically relevant. There we go. What happens is the hydrogen is pushed from the chlorine onto the oxygen. So they collide with each other and the hydrogen is transferred to the oxygen. So what you end up with is the chlorine is now by itself. And now the oxygen has three hydrogens, but it's not taking a hydrogen atom. It's taking the ion, the H plus. So you get a positive charge here. So the oxygen now has a, has a positive charge. So it's interesting. What you're doing is you're starting with two neutral molecules. HCl is neutral, no charge. Water is neutral, no charge. But because the H plus is getting transferred to the water, you end up with two ions. And this one right here is a very special ion. You should memorize the name. It's called the hydronium ion hydronium. And so we're going to write it this way. H2O accepting an H plus is H3O plus. And then if you take the H plus off the chloride, you get Cl minus. So this is called the hydronium ion. 
So if you see a problem where the base is not an obvious base, it's not lithium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide or barium hydroxide, but it's water, then just transfer an H plus to the water to form hydronium and then take the acid and just take the H plus off and then you'll have the other product, which in this case would be the chloride, okay? That ends up being a very uh, important type of analysis for the second semester of acids and bases. Um, we don't use it in this course very much, but it's important for the next course. So um, that's called the Bronsted-Lowry model, and that's going to be the reaction of an acid with water. Okay. Okay, let's see here. That's pretty good. Yep, yeah, that looks good. Okay, um, good. So that's, that sort of sums up our acid-base chemistry. So recognizing acids by their formula, recognizing bases from their formula, being able to write the products of the reaction using the double replacement idea, then being able to write the net ionic equation and then this last part of the Bronsted-Lowry model that if you have an acid reacting with water, you're going to donate the H plus to the water to form hydronium and a counter anion. Okay, so that's acid base. We don't go much into it. We're not going to talk about pH in this course. Again, pH is covered in the next course. We go into it in great depth. So if you take Chem 12, you'll, you'll spend weeks talking about things like pH and pOH and all of that stuff. Okay. Um, the third type of reaction, so the first one we did was precipitation. Okay. The second one we did was acid base. And now the third and final type is called reduction oxidation. Oops, let me spell reduction correctly. And that's otherwise called redox. Okay, for short, because reduction oxidation is a very long name, reduction oxidation. So in precipitation, what you're doing is you're taking an ionic compound plus an ionic compound, and you're forming an insoluble ionic compound, right? So for example, you take the silver ion and you combine it with the chloride ion, and that gives you a solid AgCl, right? That's an ionic reaction, it's a precipitation reaction. Acid base is where you take an acid plus a base to give yourself water and a salt, all right? We just looked at some examples there. Redox is where a reducing agent transfers electrons to an oxidizing agent. Okay, so this is a fascinating type of reaction because it involves a subatomic particle, the electron, being exchanged between two different substances. It's a really quite an amazing process. It's the idea that an atom, so I'll write little a here for atom, has an electron. And we're gonna use the little symbol E negative for electron. This subatomic particle can jump from one atom to another. Electrons are really quite remarkable little particles. They have very strange behaviors um, at the atomic level, ones that kind of in a way don't even make sense to us living in, in, in our everyday lives. They're amazing substances, amazing particles, but the electron can jump if the atoms are close enough to each other from one atom to another. And so that's called a redox reaction. And so 
the one that transfers the electron, the one that's giving up the electron is called the reducing agent. And the one that's taking the electron is called the oxidizing agent. Okay, so suppose I wrote this. Suppose I said, hey, I've got, you know, an at, let's, let's use different symbols. So atom C and atom D, and let's say two electrons are going in this direction. Okay, the source of the electrons, the one that's losing the electrons is called the reducing agent. And the one that's taking the electrons, the ones that's accepting the electrons would be called the oxidizing agent. Okay. So this happens all over. It happens in combustion reactions. That's a redox chemistry. It happens in batteries. Batteries, what happens is one metal transfers electrons to another metal. So that's redox chemistry. It happens in biological cells in plasma membranes. These organic molecules and metal ions will transfer electrons from one to another, from one atom to another. And there's energy associated with that. And so what's one of the things that's very powerful about redox chemistry is that they, these reactions are often associated with very large amounts of energy exchange that, that one atom exchanges, not only the electron, but energy is exchanged in this process. So it's, uh, it'll lead us into the next chapter, which is chapter five, where we'll talk a little bit about energy. So these redox reactions are associated with large exchanges of energy. So an example of that would be striking a match. If you ever strike a match, if you think about it, you take this little stick that has some chemicals on the surface and you put it up against a, uh, something that produces some friction and suddenly you get heat, flames, light. You can smell the fumes coming off. That's a very enthusiastic, highly energetic reaction. It's very simple to make it happen. That's a redox reaction. If you take some natural gas and put a spark to it, it will produce a blue flame that you can cook and heat with. That's a redox reaction, okay? Taking in a piece of food, some proteins or carbohydrates or fats and digesting them, that's generally redox chemistry that's going on there. There's energy associated with that and you can use that energy to keep your body warm. You can use that energy to make new chemicals that produce new parts of your body. It's a highly energetic process, okay? So the main difficulty with redox chemistry is kind of like precipitation and acid-base chemistry, which is yet to get used to the symbols that we're using, the, the symbols and the sort of notation that we're using. But from a physical perspective, it's relatively simple. One substance donates electrons to the other, Usually they're very close to each other. They're within an atom or two apart, but one will have more attraction for the electron. So we'll just take the electron off of it. And that's the transfer that's occurring, okay? So let's, um, oops, let's um, take a look at how we go about this. The most powerful technique for analyzing redox chemistry is what we call oxidation numbers. And so the textbook and Alex spends most of its time dealing with this issue of oxidation numbers. So here's what I'm gonna tell you about oxidation numbers. Think of them as being kind of like charges. Remember the electron has a negative charge. Okay, negative one, we'll call it. And so if electrons are moving from one atom to another, that means that charge is being exchanged between those two atoms. So for example, if I have an atom here 
And let's say it's negatively charged. So I'm going to write a little negative next to it. And then here's atom B. And I'm going to say this one's positively charged. OK? If an electron moves from the first atom to the other, so I'll write it this way. There's the electron moving from the first atom to the second. These are actually not atoms. They're ions, right, because they have charges. So if an electron moves, here's what happens. Let's write it this way. This atom here, A, has now lost a negative charge, right? The negative is gone. So it's now neutral, right? It doesn't have any charge anymore because a negative is gone. But what about the second atom, the B? Well, it gained the negative charge. So you just do the arithmetic. If you have a plus and you add a negative to it, that adds up to zero. So this one's also neutral. So both of them are neutral. Right? So what happens is in redox chemistry is that often, not always, but often one atom will change its charge. It'll go from, let's say, negative to zero. And another one will change from going positive to zero. Okay. And so that's typically what happens. So think of oxidation numbers as you do these problems as charges. Like what is the charge on this atom? So here's the set of rules. Neutral atoms, oops, which we call elements, have a charge of zero, so their oxidation number is zero. Okay, that's the first rule. So let me show you what I mean by that. So first, when you look at an equation, look for elements, not compounds, but elements. So this right here is an element, right? There's only, only sodium. That's only one element. If it's an element and it doesn't have any charge, then we would say that its oxidation number is zero. So I'm going to write a little zero above the symbol. Okay, That's the oxidation number. Second one, this is chlorine, Cl2. That's an element, right? There's only one symbol in there, and that's chlorine, so that's an element. There's no charges on it, so that means it's a neutral atom. Each of the chlorines has an oxidation number of zero. So there's our first rule. Okay. Second rule, monatomic ions. Oxidation number, I'm going to abbreviate this oxidation number, equals the charge of the ion. OK, there's our second rule, or guideline, if you want to use that term. So what I mean by that is the following. If you see a reaction like this one, Let's take a look. This iron right here, it's a monatomic ion. Monatomic just means one atom. That's all that means. There's one atom, an iron atom, an atom. But it's an ion because it has a charge. So if it's a monatomic ion, the oxidation number is just equal to the charge of the ion. Well, what's the charge? Plus three. So we write it as plus three. That would be the oxidation number. Then we go to the next one. The next one is 3Cl minus. Now, don't be um, confused by the three. What that means is you've got three separate chloride ions. Each one is charged negative one. So since it's a monatomic ion, each chloride ion is going to have an oxidation number of minus one. Okay. So there's your second guideline which is for monatomic ions, the oxidation number is just equal to whatever the charge is. Okay. 
Now, the third issue is how do we deal with compounds for example, C6H12O6 and polyatomic ions. So for example, C2H3O2 negative, right? So this is a compound, it's got two or more elements. And then the one on the right is a polyatomic ion because it has more than one atom and it has a charge. That's called a polyatomic ion. Okay, here's what we do with those. If it has fluorine in it, the fluorine is minus one. That's its oxidation number. If it has hydrogen in it, the oxidation number of hydrogen is plus one. And if it has oxygen in it, the oxidation number is minus two. Okay. If it has chlorine, bromine, or iodine, these are typically minus one. But these rules here take precedent. Meaning that if there's a contradiction here between this one and this one, these ones come first. They, over, they overdo the, the chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So let's take a look at an example. Let's do N O three minus. This is a nitrate ion. And what we're doing here is we're going to assign oxidation numbers to each element. Okay. Now this one right here is a polyatomic ion, just like this one here. So here's what you do. You look at the first element, nitrogen. And you say, okay, well, here's nitrogen. Is there any rule about nitrogen? There isn't. I haven't told you anything about nitrogen, so we don't know. But there is a rule about oxygen. Oxygen is minus two. So right there, we've got one element done. We know the oxygen is minus two. Okay. So you're just looking through for fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and that'll give you your answer for that one. So how do we find the nitrogen? And now we just use arithmetic. To find nitrogen, it's all about arithmetic. Here's what we do. The sum of all oxidation numbers has got to be equal the charge of the ion. OK? Pretty simple. So here's how I'll do it. We don't know what nitrogen is, so I'm going to put that as N. It's unknown. But we know that we have three oxygens, and that three oxygens, each one is negative two, right? Each oxygen is negative two. That has got to add up to the charge of the ion. Here's our charge here, minus one, OK? So now it's just a matter of arithmetic to figure out what the nitrogen is. Mathematically, we could write it this way. Three times negative two is negative six. And that's got to equal negative one. If you add negative six to both sides, oops, sorry. If you add six to both sides, you get positive five. And so now we know the nitrogen is positive five. Okay. And then you can just check your work. If you take a positive five and three negatives twos, that's going to add up to negative one. And you've now assigned oxidation numbers. Okay. Let me show you another one. Professor, um, can I ask a question? So oxygen is minus six or minus two? 
So the oxygen's minus two. So if, if the question was, what's the oxidation number of oxygen, you'd say minus two. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the minus six is only used in the calculation to figure out mm -hmm. the element. Right. Okay. So let's take a look at the acetate ion. Okay. Here we've got three elements and the first one's carbon and we don't have a rule about carbon. We really only have a rule about fluorine, hydrogen and oxygen. So we don't know, but we do have a rule for hydrogen and that's that it's plus one. And we do have a rule for oxygen, which is it's minus two. Okay. So now we just go through the arithmetic. We have two carbons. We don't know what carbon is, so I'll use its symbol. We got three hydrogens, and we've got two oxygens. And that's got to add up to the charge. Now, if it were neutral, if it were a compound, there is no charge, right? So the charge is really zero. So we just have to add up to zero. But this one is the acetate ion, so it's got a charge of negative one. So go through the arithmetic. Three times one is three. Two times negative two is negative four. And that's got to add up to negative one. Three minus four is minus one. So two C minus one equals minus one. Add, add one to both sides. Right, I'm adding one to both sides so that I can get rid of this negative one on the left side. What happens when you take negative one and one? You get zero, that's kind of weird, right? So two, Z, two C equals zero. Divide both sides by two, you get zero over two, that's zero. So there's nothing wrong with that, it can happen. What we're really claiming is the charge on the carbon is essentially zero. And so we would say the oxidation number for each of these elements we now know the carbon is zero, the hydrogen is plus one, and the oxygen is minus two. Okay. Relatively simple. Now, how do we use that? Here's the important part of this. We can assign oxidation numbers, but it's not really helpful unless it tells us something. And so here's how you do that. Here's a very simple reaction. C plus O2 goes to CO2, right? That's pretty simple. Let's assign oxidation numbers. The first one is a carbon. That's an element. It has no charge, so it's zero. The second reactant is oxygen. That's an element. It has no charge, so it's zero. Now we have a product, carbon dioxide, which is a compound. So the sum of the oxidation numbers has to add up to the charge, which in this case is zero. So what's our rules for compounds? We don't know what carbon is, but we know oxygen's gotta be minus two. So let's add it up. Carbon, there's two oxygens, so two times minus two. It's got to add up to zero because there's no charge here. It's not CO2 negative two or anything like that. It's just CO2. So it's got to add up to zero. So C minus four equals zero. Add four to both sides, you get plus four. Okay. So now we know this is plus four. So let me make a little table. So reactant side, product side. Let's do carbon and oxygen. On the reactant side, carbon is zero. On the product side, it's plus four. Uh, oxygen on the reactant side is zero. And on the product side, it's negative two. Be careful, when you write down the oxidation numbers, it's the oxidation number of one of the atoms. Okay, so for oxygen, we would put minus two, not minus four. And take a look, this is the key point here. The carbon changed and the oxygen changed. So if the oxidation number, I'll use the, the pound sign for number, 
changes for an element, then it's a redox reaction. That's the key point. What you do to figure out whether something is a redox reaction is you assign oxidation numbers to the elements. And if it changes for an element, that means it's a redox reaction. Okay. And here's the general conclusion. If the oxidation number becomes more positive for an element, element, that element is the reducing agent, OK? So if it becomes more positive, it's the reducing agent. So in this reaction, the carbon became more positive. So that means it's the reducing agent. Okay. If the oxidation number becomes more negative for an element, that element is the oxidizing agent. So more negative oxidizing agent, more positive reducing agent. Okay, so take a look at the oxygen. It became negative two, so that's more negative. That means it's the oxidizing agent. Okay, and there you go. That's it. Okay, so um, I am going to propose for all of you, of course, it's always optional, but I'm going to propose that at least for this week and next that we also meet at on Thursday morning. It's Again, it's completely optional if you want to come, and if no one comes, then I'll stop doing it, but I think it might be helpful for people to get one more hour a week um, of exposure to this, and um, so I'll I'll send out a, a message today, but I'm going to plan to meet tomorrow at, at 9 a.m. like we did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And if you can make it, feel free. And if you have questions to ask, you can feel free as well. Okay. So and it's I going to be the same uh, password and the same address. Everything Zoom? will be the same. Exactly. Okay. You know, what's kind of cool is that um, what I did was I got a Zoom account. I pay like what? It's like 12 bucks a month or something for it. But it's mm -hmm. kind of like my second phone number now because it took me a long time to realize this, but people were like, sending links and in invitations on Zoom. It's really just a phone number. So if you create an account, you get a special phone number. So my phone number is 761-534-4943. And I just remembered that phone number. So you don't need any special links or anything. But yeah, it'll be the same, same as, as the office hours and everything. I just use that number. Okay. Thank you. So I'll be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. And if you have any questions on the redox chemistry or the acid base, um, feel free to ask about that or precipitation. And then um, what I'll do is I'll also talk a little bit about um, concentrations of solutions because that's another topic we've got to cover. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Absolutely. So have a great day, you guys, and reach out to me today if you have any questions, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, chemistry is hard. <laughs> Thank you.